three, two, one. Thank All right, you. folks, thank you so much for coming in. Like I said, I was just going to simply do something uh, very informal. And um, and with your permission, we're going to record this just in the event that we maybe so people want to want to get visibility into this recording a little bit later. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know me, I mean, introductions have to start. My name is Carlos Cajigas, and um, I am the CTO at Covert Bit Forensics, which is the uh, name of my company, where we do threat hunting, incident response, and computer forensic examinations for... Uh, Fortune 100, one, Fortune 100 organizations. I'm also a principal SANS instructor at SANS, and um, we heavily use Velociraptor to to do uh, incident response and threat hunting. So um, recently, I decided that I wanted to set up a playground, and I made a playground. I made it public to anybody in the world, and we ended up getting some people actually uh, taking me up on it. And um, one of the things that I promised is we would do a little debrief to talk about what we did, how we did it. And um, and that's exactly where we are right now. So thank you so much for joining. You have the ability to unmute yourself. If you have any questions, go ahead and feel free to ask anything that you want. So um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I set up a little playground and then made up a public Velociraptor instance. Hopefully you can see it on the screen. Let me, can you tell me if you can see it, Renzon? Yep. All right, yep. excellent. So initially what I did was, um, because I told you I would be telling you how I did everything, <clears throat> I fired up a system in AWS, a server 2019 machine, which you can see right here. And, the, <clears throat> and this machine is actually, um, Literally, it's a server. It's a server system that is, but it's just sitting by itself in AWS. And then what I did was I RDP to it from the United States, and uh, I populated a little bit of data in there, including one document called confidential, which we're going to see here in just a little bit. And after populating that data, I installed Sysmon because I wanted to be able to document everything that we did. Yes, Sysmon is not installed in many organizations but I chose to install it because I'm gonna show you how valuable Sysmon is and how I am going to continue to recommend that organizations have it installed as it is going to be one of the best ways, if not the only, one of the only ways that you can get visibility into very advanced things like code injection and being able to uh, create pipes to do inter-process communication on system or even uh, other system in, uh, communications as well. The ability to create and actually use pipes for communicating to other systems is something that is really difficult to get visibility into, but Sysmon makes it extremely doable. So I'm going to continue to recommend that we install Sysmon. I'm going to show you how valuable it is. Uh, so after setting up that server, I then set up another um, server. This one was going to be an Ubuntu 20.04 system, and I actually uh, set that up as the attacker machine. I installed a utility called Sliver. Let me, show you, uh, let me show it to you. On that server, Sliver is a C2 framework that gives you the ability to be able to, well, connect to victim systems. Uh, using this utility, I created a uh, backdoor in the form of an executable, just a simple exe. I called it SVC host. I grabbed that exe and I brought it to our server and I double clicked on it literally um, during an RDP session. That, but what I did was in order to simulate the attack prior to moving that executable over to the Windows machine, I actually um, used another local machine uh, here in my home lab and I created a list of um, 500 different, just a, a TXT file with 500 different lines of just any kind of data. And then the password to the client or or the, the administrator password as the 400th line. And then I actually use Hydra to attack that, uh, that server in the cloud. And what that did was it actually populated 400 different um, failed attempts to be able to log in. Ultimately, boom, with one successful logon. And we're actually going to look into that. Once I populated that data into the server, then I actually RDP'd from Sweden um, using a VPN. Then you're going to see that I actually have a successful, successful logon, RDP logon from Sweden come in. Uh, it's going to show up here in just a little bit, all right, on this uh, server, which is still in AWS. 
And then once I successfully logged on from Sweden, then I copied and pasted the executable to the DLL host directory. And we'll talk about that in a little bit and why that is extremely important. And then once I, that SPC host inside of the DLL host directory was there, I double clicked on it and that actually started beaconing back out to my attacker machine, which was also on AWS. Last but not least, I set up, set up a third system also in AWS, which is an Ubuntu 20.04 system that actually is the Velociraptor server. So I set up the Velociraptor um, software on it and then went back. Um, actually, I did that I did that before, before I ran the malware. So um, ultimately you have three systems that are communicating in order to set up this kind of playground. And once that playground was set up and the malware had been double clicked on and the attacker had actually opened up the confidential document, one of the things that I didn't talk about is the fact that the attacker did a little bit of data exfiltration. We actually haven't even shown you how to get that visibility. I didn't talk about that on my GitHub instructions page. I simply didn't talk about it to see if people would find it. So I'll show you how that turned out. And uh, then uh, ultimately what I ended up doing was after I had um, everything set up and, you know, today is Friday. We started this on Tuesday. Today's Friday. Once the system was set up, I actually installed a couple more Windows 10 and Windows 11 machines and put the agent on it. Now you have, we have over 20 different systems communicating over to our Velociraptor instance. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of thread hunting. Any questions before we get started? I can see if you just nod or say yes or no, I can I can see your faces too. Okay, good. So, okay, what I'm gonna do now is we, we're gonna go ahead and slowly take it step by step. If you were to go to my GitHub, then you would see that this was actually what I, what I um, you know, the instructions that I wrote in GitHub. So you could follow step by step. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. I'm actually going to do a hunt and I'm gonna actually show you how it is that the data is going to be collected by Velociraptor and then we're gonna post process the data. Velociraptor is nothing more than a querying engine at its core. That's what it is. It is an executable that runs on your client and it queries your client and then ser sends data to your server, being your Velociraptor server. We, we use the GUI, we use a browser to connect to the Velociraptor GUI so that we can then post process the data. All right. So you're going to see that everything we're going to do is going to be about collecting data from your hosts, also known as clients, sending that data to the server, and then we connect to the server in order to be able to post process that data. Ready? Here we go. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with the first one. We know, or let's say that you're just starting. Right now, you're starting on a Friday. You have no idea. Obviously, uh, incidents start on a Friday. It's 3 p.m. They always start on a Friday at 4.45. So let's say that it's now 4.45 and it's a, there's an incident that is starting right now. And um, you don't know anything. Your client says, I think that there is some malware on my server. Which server? The file server, okay? So let's go ahead and say that you think that there's some malware on that file server. One of the things that we can do is once, once your agents are communicating to your Velociraptor server is, well, let's go ahead and run a list of running processes. Now, this is a lab environment. I created this lab environment to be extremely doable. When I, use, when I say the word doable, you can think of it as synonymous with easy, but there's nothing easy about what we do but it's doable. It's doable with a little bit of practice. So what I'm going to do, these are things that I consider them doable. All right. So um, I'm going to take you step by step as to why we suspect that this is going to be uh, a compromised server. All right. So the first thing we need to do is we need to collect telemetry. Telemetry being a fancy way of being able to say, give me some data. So uh, if you did the capture the flag, then you're probably familiar with the fact that you could have been able to click on this file server and then you go into the collected and then you can see all the different data that was collected. I collected all this data so that you can have a little bit of data available to be able to find the list of running processes, the established network connections. If you wanted to get visibility into where the file was, I asked a question about getting visibility into RDP activity. You would have been able to answer that with that artifact. But since we're just assuming that you don't know anything and when you're just starting the incident right now, Let's go ahead and start collecting telemetry from all these systems to see what we could do. 
In order to be able to collect telemetry from all of your systems, what you're going to do is you're going to run a hunt. You're going to run a hunt using the hunt manager right here. This allows you to run a, an artifact across your clients. Artifacts, if you've been doing forensics, you're probably familiar with that term. That is going to be something on your client that stores information that you have, that you think is a forensic value, and we call them forensic artifacts. But artifacts is also going to be the name of the um, the name that Mike Cohen, the author of Velociraptor, has decided to call um, something you you collect from your client. All right, Velociraptor utilizes something called VQL, the Velociraptor query language. We're going to run this specific VQL right now called PS list. So if I click on this PS list VQL, you're going to see that this is going to be what we're going to run on that client. When you have a VQL that has been crafted, you ultimately turn that VQL into an artifact and then you collect artifacts from your clients. What you're looking at on the screen is going to be an artifact that is called Windows System PS List. And that's what we're going to collect, not from one client, from all the clients. All right. So we're collecting telemetry by querying all of our clients at the exact same time. You're going to see how cool this is. We're going to navigate into the Hunt Manager. Click on the plus sign. There's already an, an, um, a hunt that I made that I did a little bit earlier called Hostname, just to make sure that everything is working and everything is working. All right. So we're going to create another hunt by clicking on the plus sign this new hunt we're going to give it a name how about just ps list that works for now uh, we're going to run it everywhere you can actually uh, run hunts based on labels that you assign to your clients or based on the operating system but every single one of my 21 machines is going to be a windows machine let's not get fancy with labels for now we're just making sure that we're doing things that are extremely doable and repeatable for now all right, so let's just go ahead and keep it simple. Let's go ahead and run it every, everywhere. The next thing you have to do is select the artifact. Select the artifact that you want to run. That artifact is going to be PS list. So we click on it, and then that gives us the ability to select the PS list client. There it is, Windows System PS list. Some artifacts allow you to give it parameters. Parameters are going to be flags, for a lack of a better word, flags or options that you can pass to the collection of your artifacts. This specific plugin has a process regex flag that you can pass to be able to say, okay, I want you to run on processes that are simply going to be called SVC host. I could do that if I wanted to, but let's say that you don't know what you're looking for. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to utilize the artifacts power of being able to collect telemetry and tell us which executables are untrusted. The power of Velociraptor comes in its ability to do something called data enrichment. It is going to run this plugin on the machine, which is going to be similar to Tasklist. Tasklist is a program you run on Windows that is just simply going to say, cuff up all the processes that you're running. Well, that's what the PS list plugin does. All right. The VQLs that you write in Velociraptor are going to use SQL syntax. SQL is a language that queries databases often, right? Traditionally. Well, VQL is a language that queries plugins. You may remember I mentioned the Velociraptor is a querying engine at its core. So plugins are written to query different things. PS list will query your running processes. What is it going to query about running processes? It's going to say, give me your PID, give me your parent PID, give me the name of your process, give me the command line arguments, and give me the path. EXE is going to be the path of the executable. And the data enrichment comes right here in this magic that it does. It'll grab that column and then it writes, it uses a function. Functions get created in order to be able to data enrich your columns. So the hash function is going to go into the EXE column and it's going to hash that EXE. That's how cool this thing is. But wait, there's more. Not only does it do that, it also gives you the ability to go into the executable, and then it'll actually check to see if it is going to be a trusted or untrusted executable. How? Very much like SickCheck can tell you if that is a signed binary or not. Well, Velociraptor can do that as well. Imagine if you have the ability to just simply say, give me a list of all your running processes inside of your organization and just tell me which ones are untrusted. Could you do that? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to do that right now and 
five seconds. That's the crazy thing about Velociraptor. Check it out. So we're going to run Windows System PS list. And then we're going to just uh, go ahead. I think we're ready to go. We don't have to configure any, any parameters because we're just going to get a list of all processes. And then you click launch. Launch is going to give you your hunt. Allows you to run your hunt. Hunts do not run right away. So in the event that you have to do things, uh, let's say that there's currently right now some high IO uh, that is going on in the organization, your hunts can be run a little bit later whenever you want to. So let's say that it's now in the evening and there's some time to be able to run this hunt. It's not going to affect your, your clients that much. So what you're going to do is you're going to click on this little button that says run hunt. I'm going to click on run hunt in here in a couple of seconds. What I would like for you to do is like, I would like for you to pay attention over here. You're going to see how many different clients are going to be scheduled, which you know, it's a total of 21 and then how many have finished. All right, here we go. Pay attention to that. So I'm going to click on the play button here in three, two, one, run this hunt. All right. So two have been scheduled. 21 have been scheduled. One has already finished. Wait a couple more seconds. Boom, 21 have already finished. That's it. How long did that take? I don't know. Probably less than 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds. And if we go over to the client tab, you can see how many different clients have sent data back to the Velociraptor server. So we know we have the file server sitting on AWS. And then we have these uh there are going to be 10 engineering, 10 systems that I believe are running Windows 10 from the engineering department. And then we have another 10 systems running Windows 11 from the sales department. PS List ran on them as well. And according to Velociraptor, it supposedly took about um, three seconds to run on each one of them. And each one of those systems sent a total of about 129 to 124 different rows back to the Velociraptor server. All right, so if we click on 50, you can see all the systems that are sending data back to the Velociraptor server. The magic of Velociraptor comes in its ability to post-process data. You post-process data here in the notebook. Notice that we have exactly the columns that the plugin that we ran sent back. We have the PID, the parent PID, the name, the command line arguments, the path of the executable. Here's going to be the column that can tell you uh, the hash of this executable. Velociraptor collects data and sends it to the server utilizing a key value format. If you come from a programming background, this is something similar to the data that's stored inside of a dictionary. Uh, it is going to send the data using JSON, JavaScript object notation. So it's just simply going to display the data. And if you have more than one value inside of a specific, let's call it a cell, it's going to be displayed this, this way. But you can post process this data uh, to your heart's content. Here's going to be the MD5 of that process, uh, the SHA-1, and the SHA-256 of that specific binary correction. I said process of that binary, the binary that the process points back to. And then this authenticode is going to be, it's going to tell you whether that specific, uh, let's find an, an SVC host in here somewhere. Let's see if we can find an SVC host. Uh, this is a good one. The LSAS process, the local System authority, the local security authority subsystem executable is one of the most important executables in Windows because it's the uh, process that's responsible for keeping track of the security on the machine. Uh, this needs to be a signed binary and it needs to be signed by Microsoft. You find an unsigned LSAS process on your machine with a 99% with a 99.9% .9 possibility that's going to be malware. All right, so you can see the path and you can see that this in fact is going to be a signed notice trusted a signed binary by none other than microsoft um, all right sign this binary so one of the things i like to say is hey this is a signed binary uh, move along nothing to see here it's kind of boring all right but look at all the data that we have in here if you go all the way down to the bottom actually let me go ahead and uh let me go back into the into the uh oh i have no choice but to edit this cell in order to edit this cell to get how much data we have, what you're gonna do is you click on this little white space. Most of the time, uh, if you click on this little white space, this little pencil button will, will appear. Uh, but because we're on a hunt, it's already showing. So you click on this little pencil button and then this um, cell gives you the ability to be able to edit your data. What you're looking at is 
um, a cell. So that these notebooks are going to be a way of how you can actually post-process data in Velociraptor. And it's going to also use SQL syntax. If you've ever um, taken a if you've ever taken a couple of hours to teach yourself how to craft queries, then you might be familiar with the fact that the select asterisk from something is going to be as simple as a query that you can craft in SQL syntax, which will query something and give you everything. So what this is doing is, is saying select everything from source. I'm getting rid of the limit 50. Let me show you why. Because we don't want to limit the data. We want to get everything from what? From source. What is source? The artifact that you just ran. So this is going to give you give you everything that that specific artifact collected. When we click on the save button, you're going to see that we have now a. If we go all the way down to the bottom, down to the bottom of the cell, you can see that we have collected two thousand five hundred ninety five rows from our twenty one different systems. That that means that we collected data on over twenty five hundred different processes running inside of the organization that they have that has Velociraptor agents communicating to our Velociraptor server. All right, this is a lot of data. Do you really wanna go through all these different uh, rows in here? Even if you click on 50, so you can get even more data, do you really want to go through all this data? Uh, you could, but in reality, it's a little bit inefficient. Why? Because a lot of these are signed. Carlos, are you saying that I'm never going to stumble across signed malware? Yeah, you're going to, uh, but that's going to happen in about 3% of the time. All right. And if you're the unlucky individual that has, in fact, signed malware in your organization, you know who you are. You know that you are pretty important and hopefully you have uh, other ways that you can detect that. But for now, what I'm going to recommend is that you concentrate on the unsigned, untrusted malware. I'm not saying this is something you're gonna do every time, but it's a great place to start. So what I'm gonna do, something that you can do as well, is I'm gonna go back to my GitHub and I'm going to post process this Windows System PS list artifact with this little uh, VQL data here, VQL code, or we're just simply gonna post process this data with this right here, okay? Let me go ahead and copy it from my GitHub, which you have access to, and let's go ahead and post process all this data. All right, I'm going back to the top. My goodness. What happened? Bring me back to the top. Let me try page up. That didn't work. Okay, finally got it. Got all the way back to the top. We're going to click on the pencil button and we're going to get rid of uh, everything and we're going to paste that notebook in there. What we're doing is we're using Velociraptor to say I want to I want you to remove the columns and only give me these. Give me the PID column, which you can see right here. Give me the name, which is this column. And then give me the path of the EXE, which is this column and then hash. But when you give me the hash, I want you to only give me the MD5. So notice there's a little dot in there that is going to be how you can be selective and specific about what kind of value you want from that specific entry, all right? And then we're going to do the exact same thing. From authentic code, I want you to give me this specific trusted entry, which is going to be this one right here. All right. That's what this specific little code is doing. And also something that we definitely need to add is we need to add the fully qualified domain name because we're now running hunts against the entire organization. It's a really good idea for you to know what host name has your data of interest, whatever that may be, which in this instance is obviously the malware that we're hunting for. Ready? Three, two, one, and I click save. And if this works, you can see that we still have 2,595 entries, but this looks a lot prettier. Now we have the PID, we have the name, we have the EXE, we have the hash, and then we have that specific data that you want. we want. In my GitHub, I left this specific column named hash.md5, and this specific column named authentico.trusted because I want to keep things doable. I think you're ready to graduate to something a little bit cooler. So what we're going to do right now, is we're going to go back to the top and we're going to rename those, those columns to something a little bit more doable for you to consume as a human. So we just simply add the as, and when we change this to, how about MD5 hash, that looks good. And then this authentic code, 
we're going to go ahead and rename that as signer. That's the name that I like to use for that column. You, of course, can use whatever you want. So when we click on save, that looks a little bit prettier. All right. Now, we have 2,500 entries that we have to deal with. That's too much data. So let's go ahead and actually filter that a little bit more. How? With a where clause. Wait a second. Can I actually go into that column and say, show me only or say, don't show me trusted, show me untrusted? Yeah, absolutely. How? Here we go. We do a where. And by the way, when you start typing a capital, when you start typing entries, it actually gives you suggestions. So notice that I just simply typed a W and it says, are you trying to look for the where keyword? Yeah, we do. So we just simply select it where the signer, this column, like untrusted. All right. And by the way, if you're wondering, Carlos, what the heck is this like? This is actually going to be how in Velociraptor you can do filters, but it's actually, use, this is using something called the equals tilde. The equals tilde is going to be the, the way that in Velociraptor you can do, for a lack of a better word, an egrep. It's going to be an egrep using regular expression. So this is going to be a way of actually doing a regular expression search. If you know how to create or craft a regular expressions, you know it's a very powerful way of you of you being able to filter for lots of different things inside of that column. What we're going to filter for is we're going to filter for any executable that is untrusted. Ready? Three, two, one. When I hit save, notice that that reduced my data down to only 81 that is going to be a lot, a lot more doable. The reason why you get 81 untrusted executables is because we're actually getting a bunch of false positives. These Windows applications, like uh, the terminal application, a lot of these applications today on Windows 10 are coming up as untrusted. We see them on Windows 10. On Windows 7, I was, on Windows 11, I was looking at them a little bit earlier and um, they're, they're just simply not in this specific output. All right, so, uh, if you now just simply want to scan for your untrusted applications, one of the things that you could do is you can actually just simply vis uh, visually inspect this data. And what we do here are going to be the top 50. If we go to the second page, haha, there it is right there. Look at that. This SVC host is the only untrusted executable that is showing up. That's the one that you spotted if you had taken the time to do the capture of the flag. But now we found it. We found it across all the systems within the organization. Carlos, why is this a suspicious SVC host? Because SVC host must run inside Windows System 32, and it's gonna be a child of services. An SVC host that is running outside of Windows System 32 with an extremely high possibility of chances is going to be malware. Also, SVC host is going to be, that's your service host executable. It's the process in Windows that's responsible for starting and stopping services. It is going to be signed by Microsoft. You have an unsigned SVC host outside of Windows System 32. It's time to start pay attention to that. All right. Also, what are the chances that um, that there's an SVC host on your machine that some, you know, that is signed SVC hosts are going to be across all machines in the world, right? And very often, there are going to be people all over the world that are, that is, that are sending data to VarusTotal. The next thing that I would recommend is here's the hash. You know that's untrusted. Grab that hash. And then what can you do? Go find out if that hash is known to VarusTotal. Signed binaries that are going to be very commonly seen inside Windows operating systems should be known by VirusTotal. VirusTotal is a website that is now owned by Google that gives you the ability to get some file intelligence information. You're going to get one of three things. You're going to get whether that executable is a known good executable. If it's a known good, nothing to see here. Move along. If it's a known bad executable, then that's really bad because it's known bad and it's still inside your organization. That means that your AV has missed it. And then the third thing that you're going to sometimes get if you are of importance is what you're about to see right here. Let's go to virus total. All right. And let's go do a search for that hash. Ready? Three, two, one. When I search for that hash, look what we have. No matches found. This executable has never been seen by anybody in the world. That's right. You've never seen it before. Mike's never seen it before. Renzon's never seen it before. Nobody has seen it before. Why? Because I created it. 
I created it using a off the shelf C2 framework and it has the ability to, um, you know, do evil things. And I never uploaded it to VirusTotal, so VirusTotal is not aware. That is going to be finding unknown executables that have been compiled recently inside of your organization are often as good as finding um, known evil. All right. These are definitely something that you need to pay, you need to pay attention to. All right. So there you go. That's how you can get visibility into um, the evil. We've run one single hunt. We already found it. But obviously, it's not a. We're we're gonna do a lot more. But look how you look how you reduce. You know, another thing that we could do. You reduce the output of your untrusted executables down to to eighty one. In reality, it's not eighty one. It's just a few because there's a bunch of them that are going to be um, repeated across different systems. And let me show you how we get, you know, repeated ones. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and continue here in the notebook and we're going to in, improve this VQL. We're going to add the uh, the count. Count is going to allow you to count how many times this specific entry, whatever it is you're, you're telling it to count, um, whatever it is that you're going to group by, how many times it's seen across this data right here. All right, so let's check, check this out. We're going to go ahead and do a count as count. All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, go ahead and um, tell, show me all untrusted binaries. But this time, we're going to do a group. Let's go ahead and group by MD5. All right, that means that if this specific WinStore app is seen across multiple machines, but it's the same hash, it'll tell me across how many different systems it has found it. All right, so let's go ahead and group by MD5 hash. And um, that's going to be good. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, do an order. An order by count. All right, and we're going to do an order by count in descending mode. That means that the most common are going to be at the top and the least common are going to be at the bottom. Check this out. Let me see if it works. I'm going live here, doing the, some live demos. All right, exactly what I was expecting. This Skype application is going to be the same exact application that is seen across 10 different systems. And look what we have right here, folks. If we go down to the bottom, we have that SVC host that has only been seen on when one single system. Which one? The file server that has been compromised with that specific rat. That's it. That means that that specific executable with that specific hash is only seen across one system inside your organization. What we just did is something that is going to be called stacking. Stacking is a fancy way of actually using a technique that uses the least frequency of occurrence analysis technique. It is going to look at everything you have in your organization, and then it's going to bring your outlier and actually show you the outlier. Right, being different in the incident response world is extremely important. You don't want to, in the real world, humans. You you want to stand out, right? You want to be a little bit different. In the computer world, being different is extremely rare, and you have to pay attention to that. When you find something that is not like others, it's time for you to pay attention to that. And look how powerful this technique is at being able to allow you to find that evil. Extremely, extremely. Useful folks, we have done one, one hunt so far, and that was just simply the hunt for PS list. All right, um, there's many more things that you can do. Any questions so far? All right, I can keep getting a thumbs up, so we're going to continue on. So the next thing that we could do is, hey, um, and by the way, so I can show you how weird this is. I'm going to go ahead and skip the order of uh, what I posted on GitHub. I'm actually going to introduce another artifact that I didn't even ask you to run or look at inside of uh, in our capture the flag. And that's going to be PS list. This is amazing. Let me show you how cool this is. I'm going to click on the plus sign. PS list. I'm sorry. PS tree. I think I said PS list. Let me correct myself. PS tree. PS tree. PS tree. It's going to be a plugin that has the ability to query all your processes and show you the parent child relationship. And let me show you why that's going to be important here. I'm going to go ahead and select that artifact, PS tree. 
If you've ever done memory analysis and you're probably familiar with a volatility plugin called PS3, it's very similar. It is gonna show you your parent-child relationship. Now this time, instead of running PS3 against every single, um, uh, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and run it against every single exit, every single process. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, here we go, three, two, one, we click launch. And then we are uh, just like before, we need to go ahead and run that hunt. So we click the plus sign and we run it. Give it a couple of seconds. Again, pay attention over here. 21 have been scheduled. Um, this is going to be running across all the machines. One has finished. That means that the other one should be finishing here very soon. And in fact, they are. Again, it's a really good idea to click on the clients tab so you can get visibility into which ones have finished. And uh, it appears that all of these have finished, which is really good. All right, so go back to the top click on your notebook. Let's go ahead and uh, recalculate that. And let's go ahead and start processing data. What I'm going to do right now is because I know I'm looking for an SVC host, I'm going to go ahead and right away start doing a little bit of a filter here for uh, the EXE column. All right. So I am going to build this VQL on the fly because this is not one that we had from GitHub. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how you could do this as well in the real world. Start selecting some columns. Let's go ahead and do a... Um, Go ahead and do, give me the start time. I want the start time of when that specific process started. Paste it right there. I want uh, the PID. It's a really good idea to put your PID. Go ahead and put it right there towards the beginning. And let's go ahead and we definitely need the name of the executable, which is going to be SVC host. And we definitely need the call chain, which is right here because that's what shows you the parent-child relationship. And uh, a really good idea to always add your, your fully qualified domain name so you can see the host that contains your data. That looks pretty good so far. Let's go ahead and do a save, make sure that we have some data. Nice, again, you can see it's nice and clean. You have your PID, your start time, name, call chain. Well, let's go ahead and do now a filter here. Let's do a WHERE clause inside of this column. So let's go ahead and do a WHERE, the call chain, again, just like before, SVC host. We know we're searching for an SVC host. And when we do a save, we can see that we have the normal SVC host. There's 1,800 SVC hosts running inside of our organization. Notice that every single one of these SVC hosts is going to be a child of services. That is going to be what normal looks like. All right. If you wanted to take that little trick that we did a little bit earlier. All right. So there's going to be some uh, interesting ones in here as well, but they're always going to be a child. SVC host will always be a child of services. If it's starting something, well, that's of course its job to start services. So they're going to be a child of SVC host. All right. So just like before, let's go ahead and do that same little trick. Let's go ahead and show the outliers. So come back here to the top. We do a count as count. And we definitely want to, I'm doing this, um, I haven't tested this before, we'll see what happens. Let's go ahead and do a um, group by call chain. Group by call chain. And then let's go ahead and one more time, order by count. All right, so we can go ahead and do a least frequency of occurrence. This time I'm going to not, not going to use the DIA, the, I'm going to use ascending mode rather than descending mode. So ascending mode is the default. This should bring us our least frequently seen to the top, which should be our evil SVC host. Let's go ahead and see that. Three, two, one. And exactly like what I expected. Look at this. Again, we can see that. Look at all these, uh, you know, uh, here are going to be the things that you can only see one time in the organization. And you can see you have that evil SVC host. How do you know it's evil? Because compared to the other ones, that's going to be a child of Explorer not a child of services, which is what this is, um, what normal looks like. All right, and you can see again that it is gonna be our file server, the one that is compromised. There are no other machines in this organization that are compromised. Let me go ahead and tell you that right away because I didn't set it up this way. In the future, I'm probably going to set up a domain and infect more systems, but for now, we're keeping it simple. All right, so there's going to be your infected SVC host. Look at that. One more time, another way of being able to get visibility into the fact that that is going to be an evil SVC host. Let me show you one more thing. I want to show you one more thing that uh, is going to be of important. Um, it's going to have a lot of value in here. Established connections. It's one thing to have a compromised system. 
but it's a completely different beast if your system is currently being controlled by an attacker right now. Right now. How do you know that it's controlled by your attacker right now? If that specific PID, which we just saw here is going to be PID 4120, if that specific PID is tied to an established connection, <laughs> that's a pretty good indication that your attacker has access to that system. And where are they coming from? Let me show you something really cool. All right, this is what we're gonna do. Um, when you did the capture of the flag, you were only working on one system, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do another hunt. We're gonna run a hunt here for network statistics, net stat, statist, net, net, network statistics. That's exactly what net stat gives you. Guess what? There's a plugin that can actually give you network statistics, which interestingly enough, it's called the NetStat plugin. Here's going to be what it's going to do. It's going to actually select the PID. It's going to select the name. It's going to select your uh, status, as in whether it's listening, whether it's going to be established. It's going to give you your local address and your local port. And then it's also going to give you your remote address and your remote remote port from every single system. Ready, here we go. Let's go ahead and launch that. And then just like before, we have to hit the play button to run that hunt. One more time, pay attention to the systems that are currently executed. I'm sorry, the systems that are currently scheduled and finished, folks. I don't know what that took, probably less than five seconds. And now we have network statistics for every single one of our systems. If you had a rat that is listening this would show it to you. All right. So what we're doing is going to look, we're going to look for that SVC host that is going to be tied to PID. I think 4120. I'm going off memory here. So just like before, we're going to go in, into the little pencil and we're going to post process this data. What we're going to do in here is we're going to keep it simple. Uh, how about we just simply say, show me every single system that has where, where the status is going to be established, all right? Let's go ahead and click on the Save button. And that actually reduces the data down to 533. That's a lot. That's still a lot. Um, even though it's a lot, it's a lot. I mean, you could filter it down to the SVC host and then count it uh, in order for you to be able to do least frequency of occurrence. But I'm actually going to show you a cooler little trick. When I do this, in organizations, I like to get visibility into which processes currently have an established connection to anybody outside of the United States. Why? Well, because very often the clients that I work with may not necessarily be doing business with, maybe, may not be, um, other countries that may not be friendly to them. And if you have a rat that is communicating to a country that is not a friend of that organization, this technique that I'm about to show you can give you that visibility. So what we're going to do is we're going to in, we're going to enrich we're going to enrich this remote address IP column. How? With the uh, MaxMind GeoIP database. I've taken the time to upload a GeoIP database to my server, and there's actually a function called IP that can do that. I'm actually going to go ahead and steal that from our GitHub. Let me actually show you what we're going to do. So. Give me a couple of seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and actually show you step by step what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and go back into my uh, DQL and I'm going to say I'm going to reduce the output. I'm going to reduce the output to actually, no, that's not going to be. Give me a second. That was uh, I got it from another location. Here it is. Let me do this again. I'm going to reduce the output to. I got this from the netstat notebook in your GitHub, in our my GitHub that you have access to. Right there. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the timestamp. I'm going to grab the PID, which is here. I'm going to grab the name of the process, status, local address, local port, remote address, remote port, and I'm going to add a fully qualified domain name. All right. Let's see where every connection is established. Ready? Go ahead, hit save. Okay, that makes it a lot, <clears throat> a lot prettier. We can see that we indeed still have 533 lines. But now what I'm going to do is you have this in your in my GitHub. There's going to be this specific line in here that I'm going to bring in. I'm going to show you. Give me just one second. All right, it's this line right here. I'm going to go ahead and actually edit it. I'm going to add a comma in here. 
you know what? I'm going to put it. <clears throat> I'm going to put it after the. I'm going to put it in between local address and local port, which is going to be right here. I'm going to hit enter to put that in the next line. All right. I'm going to hit enter again so you can see exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to add this here. This is the uh, geo IP function that is going to go into the source IP column, which should be, I'm sorry, it's going to go into the, uh, yeah, as the source IP column is not here, so I stole this from another notebook, so I have to change this. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna change this to the remote IP. This one here. Hopefully this works. Let's find out. I need to grab these. Uh, hopefully this will work. If not, I will rename it. All right. So I'm gonna say go ahead and go into the remote address IP, and then use this uh, geo IP database that is in my Velociraptor server, and then use that as a new column called country. All right, and that's the data that I want. Let me see what happens. Let's see if this works. Three, two, one, I hit save. Yeah, it's working, perfect. Notice that now for every single established connection, it is now resolving that specific IP address to a country. Look at that. So these are going to be a lot of um, connections back to the US. All right, look at that, connections to the US, lots of them, lots of them. Now, if you want to re just simply take this out, not, or, you know, just simply filter this out, look how doable this is. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back here and then we're gonna go ahead and actually do a, uh, where status like establish and status. Let's go ahead and do a not status not status like that specific filter or entry, which is going to be the United States. All right, so this specific PQL should filter all this data out and only show me established connections that are not, did I say status? Sorry, it's not status, it's country. There you go, that are not the United States. Here we go, that should work, let's find out. <laughs> there it did. Look how cool this is. What you're seeing in here, folks, is the result of actually me creating a uh, sliver executable that calls to an attacker machine, which is also an AWS, under that specific IP address. All right. So this specific system, File Server 02, is currently talking to an attacker machine that I set up in Sweden. Why? Because I wanted to do this right here, all right? I want you to appreciate the power of this utility. I'm not saying that your attackers are going to set up connections to countries outside of the United States all the time, but guess what? I've worked many incidents where they do. I worked an incident just three months ago where an organization was hit with a LockBit 2.0 ransomware and the attacker actually introduced FileZilla and had an established connection to an IP address outside of the United States for two days as the attacker was filtering data out. How do I know that? Because there's a beautiful database called SRUM, the System Resource Usage Monitor database that keeps track of how many bits and bytes each process is responsible for uploading and downloading. And I was able to see that the FileZilla process was run for about around a little bit less than 48 hours. And if you are familiar with FileZilla Forensics, then you may know that FileZilla actually keeps track of the IP address that it last used. It does store that, I believe, inside of an XML file. And uh, guess what? The IP address was still inside of that XML file. And when we resolved that IP address, it was an IP address that was, that was outside of the United States. All I'm saying is, if we are going to be looking, we're going to find things. Had somebody been looking in that organization for evil, they could have possibly spotted this. All right. All right, folks. Any questions? Because we're running out of time. What I want to do right now is I want to do a couple more things that you were um, that you were asked in the uh, capture the flag. All right. And it's going to be, um, what, for example, when was the malware executed by the attacker? What we're going to do right now is we're going to go, since we know that um, 
this specific system, file server 02, is in fact compromised, we're going to click on the client ID. When we click on the client ID, it actually, Velociraptor puts us on that specific server. And now rather than having to do a hunt so we can hunt across the entire organization, we can actually do, we click on this collected artifacts section here and we can collect artifacts from just that specific server. And that's exactly what you are doing if you had taken the time to do the capture of the flag. If you had taken the time to do the capture of the flag, you would have been able to do lots of really cool things. For example, when was the malware executed? We here at Cobra Bit Forensics took the time to write a custom artifact that goes into Sysmon and pulls out event ID 1. Event ID 1 is going to be process creation. So we already took the time to run this. And if you would use that same little technique that we have been using in order for you to be able to query the machine, you would be able to go into that artifact, go, go into your notebook, and then grab the little, um, for example, let me go back and show you. Grab that specific code in here. And by the way, you can use the copy to clipboard over here and then put it in your notebook. And then, aha, <laughs> when you actually delete this and put this data in here, this is going to look at all the data that we have for this specific artifact. And it's simply going to show you anything that has executed out of the DLL host or where that, where the image, which is going to be this specific column in here contains that specific string. All right, three, two, one. When I hit enter, look what you get. Look how cool this is. Again, PID 4120. We have our SVC host that's running out of the DLL host directory. Look at the parent process, Explorer. Why? That's the GUI. That means that somebody double clicked on that executable. Here are going to be your command line arguments, the user. So, whoa, the administrator double clicked on that executable. That means that um, there's a very good possibility that that administrator user has local admin privileges on that machine. So that means that they can execute malware. In fact, they did. And you can see you, uh, Sysmon grabs the MD5 hash of that process. But I also took a couple of seconds to actually pull out file version information. If you've ever run SickCheck across an executable, then you know that SickCheck, which is also another utility from SysInternals, can tell you if an executable has file version information, description, uh, company information. And so legitimate programmers, most of the time, take the time to actually write file version information into their executables. Uh, off the shelf malware and, um, you know, uh, attackers that are not going to be taking pride in their craft, they usually don't add any file version information. Well, guess what? Would you like to be able to find processes that have been executed inside your organization and then actually filter? for files that don't have any file version or description information, there's a way you could do that. If you want this artifact, I'm gonna be po posting it on my GitHub a little bit later. I have to organize it, but I'm gonna uh, make it available. You can run Velociraptor across your Sysmon event logs and actually start doing filters for any one of these columns the exact same way that we have in the entire demonstration, in, in the entire demo. All right. so. That's just yet another way that you can go about doing some threat hunting inside of your organization. So that's going to be another of the questions that we have. Ah, and then I have to talk about this one. Does the malware have persistence? This is pretty cool. Um, we actually, uh, Velociraptor also has the ability to bring in any kind of executable. I've already taken the time to execute auto runs against the uh, this specific file server machine. And then if you were to grab this specific VQL from my GitHub, and just simply post it in here. All right, I'm going to delete it, paste it. This is actually going to do a count just like before. And it's going to pull out this kind of information from the output of sysinternals. And then it's going to say, don't show me anything. Um, in, uh, show me things that are enabled, and um, but not things that are going to be signed or things that are and, and also show me things that are not verified. In other words, it's, uh, this is going to say, only show me things that are unsigned, that are not trusted. This is what this is doing. And it's grouping by the path of the executable and the launch string column. And just like before, using the least frequency of occurrence, look what you have in here. These are going to be a, um, a specific entry for that specific evil SVC host inside of the DL host directory, which is called 
Google Updater. And this is going to be an entry inside of the current version run key, by the way. All right, so even though it's not showing up in here, this is actually going to be a persistent mechanism that I put inside of the current version run key in the software hive. So does this specific evil SVC host have persistence? Yes, you better believe it that this is the only entry inside of the organization that has this type of, of specific persistent mechanism for that specific binary. Again, another... Um, way for you to be able to do thread hunting across your entire organization. For our clients, this is something that we run. If your machines are built similarly from the same gold image, they should have pretty much similar things on them. But if you have one system, you have a thousand machines and you have one system that has a that persistent mechanism is the only one, would you be able to spot it? I think that you could. I think that you could. All right. All right. And what I want to close out this demo is with one more thing that I want to introduce you to, and uh, it's going to be Hayabusa. Hayabusa is a newer utility that has is making a lot of positive noise recently. Hayabusa is going to be a utility that grabs your that grabs Sigma rules, and it runs Sigma rules against the event logs live on the machine. And it is going to be, uh, after it runs runs Sigma rules against your event logs, it is going to, of course, uh, send the data to the Velociraptor server. And you can now post-process that data looking for critical things that happen on the machine. What's a critical thing? Well, it depends on the, on the Yara rule, but very often these critical things that um, Sigma finds are going to be things that you need to pay attention to. All right. If you're unfamiliar with Sigma rules, I don't blame you. Um, hopefully you're familiar with Yara. Yara is going to be a, um, a very doable, doable language to learn. Uh, it was created by the folks over at VirusTotal, which they refer to it as the Swiss Army knife for malware hunting. It is going to be a, um, a language that allows you to create rules that are going to find things based on certain parameters that you dictate. For example, these specific strings inside of an executable. If you select a certain number of strings that are only found on a version of the executable that you're finding for, for whatever kind of malware that you're searching for, it gives you the ability to go from finding something that you know nothing about, quickly running strings at that against that executable, and then creating a Yara rule that searches across your entire organization for variants of that executable, all right? In essence, it's an antivirus rule on steroids that you can create in a matter of seconds. I always stress that it's important to learn how to write Yara rules because when you're dealing with an unknown piece of malware that's never been seen by anybody before, are you really going to rely on your AV for them to actually update the virus definitions so that they can actually get rid of the malware across your organization? You shouldn't. Why? Because it's going to take a couple of days, maybe a couple of hours if they're quick in order to be able to do that. With a utility like Velociraptor, you can create a Yara rule in minutes and then you actually can search across your entire organization with Velociraptor because Velociraptor can search across the file system based on Yara rules. And it can also search in memory based on Yara rules. Sigma rules, on the other hand, search logs. All right. So Sigma is going to be what Yara is for files and what Snort is for network. It is going to be that for logs. It is going to be something that is going to search your logs based on rules that you create and rules that you dictate. What I used is I use Hayabusa to be able to grab a bunch of Yara rules, all of the rules, and run all of the rules against the event logs. And then what I did, once the data was sent to my Velociraptor server, I simply did a filter for where the level is high. All right, so show me entries where the level is high, and that's it. And I want to show you that there was a Yara, um, there was a Sigma rule that actually found lots of really cool things in here. All right. The fact that, uh, let me show you something. Let me see. Here it is right here. There were rules that found the fact that this specific SVC host process 
indeed was going to be of interest. You can see that it actually read our Sysmon event logs and it was able to find a suspicious SVC host process because there's a rule that is going to give you visibility into when an SVC host executable is found outside of Windows System 32. So even though this is an unknown piece of malware, if there is people in the organization that is that are going to be conducting these kinds of search, searches with this free utility, utilizing Hayabusa, which is 100% free across the organization, there is going to be a way that you can get visibility into evil inside of your organization as long as somebody is in fact searching for this evil. All right, we're going to all we're going to miss 100% of the things that we don't look for, but if somebody is looking, you can give yourself a chance at being able to find these things. All right. Any questions, folks? All right. Um, so, what what's what about the future? What's what does the future hold? I'm going to tell you that I had a blast creating this. I had a blast giving you access to it. Uh, I made I made new friends. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth that was going on. Uh, I had some questions that were asked, and then being able to do this debrief was pretty cool as well. It's just a, a way for you to be able to see that, in fact, this utility is going to be able to give you the ability that you need to be able to get visibility within your environment. What I would like to do is I'm definitely going to do this again in the future. I don't know when, but I'm definitely going to do it again. And what I would like to do is find somebody who is going to be interested in helping me set up a domain. I'd like to set up a domain in the cloud that contains uh, Windows 10, Windows 11 machines, a file server, and a domain controller. And then what I would like to do is I would like to actually execute uh, a little bit of a PowerShell remote across the organization and then do this again and give you, anybody in the world, access to the Velociraptor server so you can play with this. All right. So if you know somebody who can help me with uh, setting that up, uh, my email is right here. All right. So go ahead and send me an email and let me know that you can help me out. All right. All right, folks, give me a couple of seconds. I'm going to say thank you so much for attending. Hang in there. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop the recording. So goodbye, folks.